I'm Dean Curian, who's from Carl and Edith from the Center for Research and Education at Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, and also Deputy Editor for Jay Sky. I'm here today with Dr. Kush Patel from University College of London Arts Art Center in London, who's the first author of a paper entitled Outcomes of the Novel Supreme Drug Eluting Stents in Complex Coronary Lesions, a Pioneer 3 Substudy. Joining us are panelists, Dr. Andreas Bombach, Bart Sartz, senior author on the paper, and Dr. Marty Leon, Columbia University Irving Medical Center and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. But Dr. Leon is also a study chairman of the Pioneer 3 trial. I'd like to welcome everyone and ask Dr. Patel to briefly summarize the key methods and findings of the paper. Kush? Thank you, Dr. Garrison. I'll um, share my slides with you. So I'm going to present the, a sub-study of the Pioneer 3 trial uh, titled Outcomes of the Supreme drug Eluting Stents in Complex Coronary Lesions. These are our disclosures. So the Pioneer 3 study was published in circulation last year. And this was a randomized clinical trial assessing the safety and efficacy of the supreme drug looting stent uh, in patients with coronary artery disease compared to durable polymer everolimus looting stents. And this demonstrated non-inferiority of the supreme stent. The supreme drug looting stent is designed to promote endothelial healing to reduce any stent-related adverse events. And it's particularly relevant uh, potentially in patients with coronary lesions, where we know they have a high rate of adverse events. So this sub-study aimed to compare the outcomes of PCI at one year after PCI in complex coronary lesions between the supreme drug looting stent and standard of care, which is a durable polymer, everolimus looting stent. The Pioneer 3 trial was a multi-center, single-blind study. It randomized over 1,600 patients who presented either with an acute or coronary, chronic coronary syndrome in a two-to-one ratio to the supreme stent or a durable polymer everolimus saluting stent. And for this particular sub-study, we classified complex coronary lesions according to the ACC AHA classification. So we considered lesions which were type B2 or C uh, as complex coronary lesions. And this included moderate to severe calcification, long lesions greater than 20 millimeters in length, and moderate to severe tortuosity. For this study, we had 1,137 patients included. The primary endpoint at one year was target lesion failure. And this was a composite of clinically driven target lesion revascularization. Um, secondary endpoints included lesion success, uh, which was defined as attainment of less than 30% uh, stenosis on coronary, uh, on quantitative coronary angiography using any piece percutaneous method. Device success was defined as lesion success um, with the assigned um, device. Target vessel failure was defined as a composite of cardiac death, myocardial infarction, and target vessel revascularization. The latter was one of the secondary endpoints as well. Major adverse cardiovascular events was defined as all-cause mortality, myocardial infarction, and target vessel revascularization. And we also included stent thrombosis. So the primary endpoint of target lesion failure was similar between both cohorts. 5.6% and 5.7% in the durable polymer versus supreme drug eluting stents. And as you can see, the blue line here represents supreme stents and the durable polymer is represented by the red line. In terms of secondary endpoints, lesion success was high and similar in both cohorts. So was device success. Target vessel failure was 6.5% versus 7.4% and similar. Target lesion revascularization was 2.5% in the supreme group compared to 0.9% in the durable polymer group. And the p-value did trend towards statistical significance with a p-value of 0.06. MACE rates were 7.8% versus 8.5% and similar. And so was stent thrombosis at 
versus 1.1 percent respective. If we dig down a bit more into the endpoints, clinically driven target lesion revascularization, which is defined as having uh, objective evidence of ischemia, did trend towards higher rates in the supreme stent, 2.3% versus 0.9% in the durable polymer stent. P-value for this was 0.079. And if we further stratify stent thrombosis according to the time from PCI, so less than one day, two to 30 days, and greater than 30 days, you can see there were similarities in the acute and subacute stent thrombosis. The rates were similar. However, in late stent thrombosis, we did have slightly higher rates in the durable polymer group. But you can see the numbers were quite small, and that's represented by the figures in the, in the brackets. We also looked at the subtype of lesion and tried to understand how the pathology itself affected outcomes. So we compared severe calcification to mild and moderate calcification, severe tortuosity compared to mild and moderate tortuosity, and long lesions compared to short lesions. Both the length of the lesion and tortuosity did not affect outcomes, but calcification did. And we saw several trends and significance uh, with regards to patients who had severe calcification. For example, target lesion failure, 8.1% compared to 4.9%. This trended towards significance. Device success was lower in patients with severe calcification. Target vessel failure was higher and MACE rates were higher. So we concluded from this study that the supreme drug eluting stent is similarly effective and safe at one year compared to standard durable polymer everolimus eluting stents. And this is across a broad spectrum of lesion complexity. We also demonstrated that severe calcification is associated with more adverse events compared to mild and moderate calcification. Thank you. That's really excellent. Thank you very much for that presentation, Chris. You know, based on the premise that the Supreme DS is designed to promote endothelial coverage and stamp healing, and that this attribute would be more relevant, if you will, in complex lesion subsets, can you um, provide any uh, comment on the unique device components or preclinical observations that would support that hypothesis? And I might throw that out for Marty and Andreas as well. You want to start, Kush? Yeah, so one of, some of the design attributes that, that helps for this was the, the underlying uh, polymer that's used is resorbed quite quickly. It's supposed to be resorbed in four to six weeks. It also contains styrolimus, which is supposed to elute stuff within 28 days, about 90% drug elution within 28 days. And this sort of all sits on quite a thin base layer. Uh, which is supposed to encourage endothelial cell migration. And uh, the this, this struts are thin. It's a cobalt chromium stent that all this sits on top of. Great. Any other comments, Marty? Yeah, I think the technology of this device are, um, is, is truly differentiated. Uh, the difficulty we're having is to express the uh, technological differences um, into a clinical trial scenario where you can see differential biologic effects. Um, and the technical differences are that this is, um, uh, it's an absorbable polymer that absorbs very quickly and that there's concordance between the polymer absorption and the drug elution in terms of timing. And this is unique amongst all of the uh, uh, resorbable uh, drug eluting stents in that the polymer does release much sooner, and that does promote faster um, endothelial coverage because there's less of an inflammatory response to bare polymer. In addition, I think the electrografted base layer, which is a PBMA very thin polymer, tends to protect the underlying um, metallic stent from corrosion and other inflammatory changes tends to orient the top coat and improves the ability and access uh, to the drug. Uh, so it has some interesting features 
And in preclinical studies, OCT studies, animal studies, uh, cell block studies, there's no question that this device is certainly um, uh, um, among the better devices in promoting early endothelial coverage, which should have a pro-healing effect. I guess the question is, how do we translate that technology difference into a clinical trial that might result in um, outcome differences? And I'm not sure that this current regulatory trial, uh, you know, given the patients that were treated and the duration of follow-up, is, is really the target population that would allow you or expect to see very much of a difference between this and what is otherwise a very good durable polymer um, a drug eluting stent. So I'm not surprised at the outcomes, but I'm also not disappointed that this device uh, um, certainly was deliverable, uh, certainly showed some, some soft trends to, um, to outcome benefits from the standpoint of um, safety factors, such as um, uh, late stent thrombosis or target vessel MI. Um, I just don't know that we've studied enough of the most susceptible patients for long enough to see an expressed clinical benefit. So, so that work still needs needs to be done. Yeah, Marty, of course, has comprehensively uh, uh, illustrated what the, what the device actually does and what's, what differentiates it from others. And whilst it's difficult to um, get to the biological effect and, 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 and benefit in a, in a trial, uh, what this subgroup analysis, uh, to come back to the paper, does, it actually shows that there is no uh, uh, no drawback, no uh, negatives. It's a very sophisticated uh, design. It's a very good stent, and it delivers uh, acute success comparably uh, to a workhorse stent that we're all used to. So, you know, uh, th th I think that's one important aspect of this uh, of this paper. One of the things I might add is that the duration of follow up here is just one year, and uh, part of the benefits of this device, at least in preclinical work, looking at Evans Blues, is it's significantly less than science. That's been correlated with albumin uh, endothelial cell permeability and the subsequent development of neoatherosclerosis. So if it is effective in reducing neoatherosclerosis to some degree, we won't see that yet. Um, and that would be a potential, at least theoretic, benefit. And in fact, you know, the the, the study, Dean, as you know, has a second primary endpoint, which is a landmark analysis of a composite endpoint between two and five years. Um, so from the outset, we anticipated that there would be an accrual of safety events that potentially could be aborted by a design like this. So we need to wait for longer follow-up. Um, Kush, could you comment on the apparent differential? Uh, if you were to do a risk ratio hazard ratio, the 2.3 or 2.5 absolute rate for TLR when you're compared to 0 0.9 in factors that would go into that. The p value doesn't reach statistical significance, but if one were to do a risk ratio, it might be impressive. Uh, how would you, what factors went into that? Can you? Talk about that. This is a 0.9 looks incredibly low. For it was, this. yes. Especially if you compare it to other studies that reported between 1.9 and 2.4%. Um, and that may be what we're seeing there in, in our study, the slightly higher rate of T, a target lesion revascularization within the supreme stent. Um, it may be all down to the fact that our control or our durable polymer stent didn't have many events. Yes, I mean, it, it could be play of chance, but, um, you know, um, we, we can never rule that out uh, in, in a population like that. We saw play of chance in big trials. I mean, in the absorb uh, 3, Marty remembers this well, there were zero stent thrombosis for that stent. They just kept going for three years. So, I mean, this is, uh, sometimes these things happen, and I think this is, in large part, uh, magnified by play of chance here. No question. Um, the B2C premise, really, did B2C make a difference, the complexity of lesion? There are some trends, aren't there? They were, yes. So we saw, we saw the differences between severe calcification and less severe 
but we did see it with it with the other subtypes, so lesion length or tortuosity. Uh, one of the things that we realized with this study was that we used, on average, uh, one stent per patient. And it may be that the complexity that we were seeing in our patients was not as complex as other studies that have managed to show uh, a significant difference in patients with severe tortuosity compared to less severe. What trends in cardiovascular and in cardiac related death that, that I found interesting? what the mechanism might be, but then. Yes, there were, there were some trends there. Um, again, the numbers were quite low with this study, uh, but yes, there were. I think you specified that this was, um, this was pre-specified as, as a limitation in the study, but not stratified. So it really yes. did not create a randomized trial within the trial. Yes. That's good. I was surprised at the radial access, Andreas. You know, we have eighty-two percent radial access for the Supreme stent. That's higher than any uh, clinical trial, higher than other devices that have been designed to improve transradial access. Pretty amazing. Yeah, well, I'm disappointed it's not ninety, but um... <laughs> <laughs> spoken as a European, I love it. I love it. It's great. Any anything. Uh, Anything else, Marty, that you would say on that? I mean, I was very impressed. No, that was impressive. I think we stressed radial access, but uh, and it's nice to see that we're, you know, achieving such um, high numbers, not quite as high as Europe, but we're getting there. Um, I mean, one observation I would make is that I tend to think that uh, it's about time to retire the B2C classification concept. I really don't think it adds very much. Uh, anymore. I think it's of more historic than a reasonable recent clinical interest. And as you can see, in, in what was a fairly generic trial of more comers, 70% were so-called B2C. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so I really do think that we need to come up with better um, ways of classifying complex lesions that might benefit from advanced technology such as this. And it may be, you know, diabetics that have long lesions, or it may be acute coronary syndrome we should be thinking about. There, um, certainly, you know, the trend now to high bleeding risk. You have to think about the clinical and anatomic scenarios that might best favor a device of this kind. So, um, uh, you know, it's like trying to drive a Ferrari um, in New York City. You really can't feel the effects of a Ferrari in New York City. You might as well be driving a Volkswagen. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I, I would agree with that. And, and uh, the the A B one B two C classification is is old. It comes from the early days of balloon angioplasty, yes. um, where some of these things were indeed complex osteolesions or bifurcations you couldn't protect. But these days, these are routine. Uh, lesions and really don't add to complexity, whereas calcification, very long lesions and tortuosity can add to, to, to problems. And that was one of the reasons we, we, we pre-specified and said we, we want sub-analysis on very specific lesion types uh, that are of relevance for the interventional cardiologists and for the outcomes, uh, and hence those three uh, types that we identified. You know, there was not an imaging uh, sub-study, intravascular imaging sub-study in this trial, correct? Bush? Yes, there wasn't. But we did learn from prior studies with this device, with the Supreme, that the endothelial coverage and spread coverage and healing appears to occur very rapidly. And those studies, correct me if I'm wrong, show a greater than 80% spread coverage as early as one to three months. Um, Anyone want to comment on that? Well, I think the healing behavior is not so different than a bare metal stent. And I think that that's an interesting observation. And from the standpoint of what should be standard uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, I think that you can take certain liberties with a device like this, where the polymer is gone so quickly and the drug is incorporated into the vessel wall very early. Uh, in terms of your pharmacotherapy as well. Any other comments? 
No, I think what we what what Marty pointed out about the the overall endpoints and the expected real biological benefit. Uh, that is a waiting game. We really have to wait this out and see what happens in, in two to five years after uh, the implantation and re- whether this theory, theoretical benefit um, that was shown in uh, animal experiments and uh, the benefit we expect from an early coverage in the OCT studies, whether that translates into a substantial benefit in reducing late events uh, we have to see. We'll have to wait. With that, uh, you know, I want to thank each one of you for being here. Marty, Grants, Bush, excellent presentation. And thank you, Jay Sky, for giving us this opportunity uh, in a, for a paper that will be out in the first issue. Absolutely. Can't wait to see that in print. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.